Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm here to talk a little bit about a case study that uh, I work at a company called Lunar, and, and this is just our sort of adoption story of service mesh uh, in a financial service uh, industry. So yeah, building a scalable, compliant, multi-cloud bank with a service mesh. Just uh, before that, I'll just introduce myself. My name is Casper. Uh, I work as a lead platform architect at Lunar, but I'm also sort of in my spare time work, uh, praying around as a Cloud Native Computing Foundation ambassador. I've uh, been in this uh, meetup space community, driving meetups in, in, in Europe uh, for quite a while. Founded something that we call Cloud Native Nordics, which was like a, a meetup alliance across different uh, uh, meetup groups in, in the Nordics of, of Europe. Um, and yeah, just trying to, to build the community around Cloud Native in, in general. Um, I'm also a LinkedIn ambassador, so I guess that's sort of a spoiler alert on, on the service mess that we chose. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, the last thing about me, I was uh, my, my way into this, uh, this space around Cloud Native was actually before it was called Cloud Native. I did a master thesis in 2016 about Raspberry Pis and Kubernetes and how sort of universities could utilize uh, Raspberry Pis to actually sort of teach, teach students about this new, new way of doing things. So a little bit about Lunar. We uh, was founded in 2015 uh, as a, like a challenger bank fintech uh, kind of uh, company. Uh, been venture backed uh, ever since, got a lot of rounds. Um, we now have offices uh, around the, the Nordics in Europe, uh, approximately 550 customers, and also like a business, uh, business uh, segment. Um, 650 employees now, uh, it's been growing pretty quickly, and you'll see a graph in a second. Uh, so, from the more technical aspects, um, we deploy around uh, 50 changes to production on average uh, every day. So I think that's at least from comparing to the, the, the banks in the Nordics, at least that's a, a pretty high number because they are probably doing it once a week or once a month um, with a lot of those we, we've been talking to. Yeah, um, run around 400 microservices now uh, across three different clouds. So that's also the multi-cloud aspect and the multi-cluster aspect of it. Um, the scale and the growth, um, so as you can see, we, we, we sort of had like an uh, exponential growth in, uh, from, from 2019, both in terms of customers, but also in terms of uh, employees at the company. Um, we went from, I, don't, I think, around 150 employees in, in 19 to almost 700 uh, employees uh, uh, now. So it's been growing pretty quickly. Um, we adopted Kubernetes back in, in 17, so we've been running this for, for quite a while and sort of been evolving as the community has been evolved and uh, looking at all the different projects and things that we could use um, from the CNCF. Um, also a couple of acquisitions, uh, which we're also going to touch a little bit about because that's also part of this multi-cloud uh, strategy that we are sort of working with. But let's talk a little about how we actually sort of started out our evaluation story of a, of, of a service mesh, how we actually did, did this. Um, we, it's always been a co complexity compared to the value we were sort of getting. Um, Initially, as, as you saw on the graph, we, were, we weren't that many people, uh, especially not in sort of the platform area of the, of the company. We were one, two people. So complexity was really something that we, we needed to, to ensure that, uh, that we were able to sort of you know, handle that um, as we sort of grow. So it took a while for this before the sort of the feature set um, was, was there for us. Um, and what really tipped the scale was the multi-cluster aspects, and, and I'll come back to that a little bit later, what, why that is. Um, but we basically evaluated service mesh for three and a half years before we actually adopted it. One, we tried out the layer, first LinkerD one, uh, LinkerD one with the node uh, proxy uh, set up daemon set deployments and everything. When Istio came out, we tried that out. It was a bit too complex for us at that time. Uh, then LinkerD sort of changed into Conduit, tried that out. We were, weren't really ready yet. We were still like one and a half people, as you can see at the bottom. Um, LinkerD, LinkerD2, yeah, still not <laughs> enough people to actually handle the complexity of actually adding this into our stack. And uh, bear in mind, these platform engineers were focusing on Kubernetes, observability, all, all the, the, the stuff that we have running. Um, so. It wasn't until yeah, 2020, sort of, we, we needed to, uh, we were in the process of actually becoming a bank at that point, um, and there were some requirements in actually getting a banking license, so we were starting to look in, looking at all the, the features again, uh, having MTLS, all, all these things uh, were so, sort of a thing that we, we now needed to look at again. 
and also this multi-class uh, multi-cluster uh, sort of thing was uh, becoming a, a, um, sort of a, a topic for us and I'll show you that in a second so which one to choose well for us it was really about the, the simplicity of uh, of the mesh and and for us uh, with the number of people simplicity was really the, the thing and then uh, at, at this point uh, the Linkerd2 proxy at least had like uh, a lower sort of um, resource um, so it was also like a, bit, a little bit of a, a cost perspective to it, but it was really about simplicity for, for us. So multi-cluster. The reason for why we started out doing multi-cluster was that we were sort of having this setup where we had like different environments. We were replicating our observability stack. We had a lot of uh, you know, stateful complex services that are pretty hard to sort of run. Um, and that was pretty annoying to, to sort of have that replicated setup between all the different environments. So we wanted to do something else. And at this point, we were also sort of like moving towards uh, GitOps. We were using and storing all things in a Git repository. And we were experimenting with uh, treating our clusters as cattle to actually be able to uh, uh, you know, kill a cluster and, and spin up a new one and recreate the state based on what was in Git. So using Git as the source of truth. Um, but there was a problem with this. Um, and the problem was that our lock system, which was sort of, it was Humio, as you can see here. I'm not sure if you're familiar with it, but it doesn't really matter that much. But it, it used like an EBS volume. And the problem uh, that we sort of saw was that when we created a, a, our failover cluster, um, we needed to recreate this data. Um, so we were all we were constantly taking snapshots of this EBS volume. And then at some point, we needed to restore it and, and sort of hook it into to the to log management solution in the failover cluster. And we were losing logs, which wasn't really a good thing for us because all audit logs, everything was sort of flowing into the system. So that wasn't really acceptable in order to, to do this. So we needed to find an, another way to actually uh, so, sort of centralize our log management because that was sort of what we wanted to do. Uh, if you want to know more about the failover cluster setup, uh, my colleague uh, Henrik did a keynote uh, at last KubeCon in Valencia about the failover story and how we do that. Um, I think I have a link down there. Yes. Um, so yeah, if you want to know more about that, check that out. But what we really wanted to do was centralize uh, and create like this platform uh, type of cluster where we could store all kinds of different platform related things and use this cluster to um, to make it easy for, for workload clusters to send uh, log data to a centralized place, to send metrics to a centralized place, and, and so on and so forth. Um, so what we did was actually starting to, to try this out with uh, a service mesh and connecting clusters across uh, AWS accounts um, by basically adding a service mesh, trying it out. Um, we tried out both uh, Istio and, uh, and Linkerd at this point, and, and for us, it took like an hour to get Linkerd up and running, which was pretty amazing for us to, to just see, hey, now we are able to, to actually connect clusters across clouds. And so we actually just used that. Um, but our sort of initial adoption of service mesh was basically to, to do this multi-cluster setup where we sort of put Fluent Bit into the service mesh and the log management solution into uh, to the service mesh. And from the point of Fluent Bit, as you can see up in the, the workload clusters, it, it's basically just a transparent communication because it's just rewriting to a, a normal Kubernetes service in, in this setup, and then it flows through uh, the multi-cluster uh, control plane that I'll introduce in a second. But it was pretty nice. Um, one thing that was also very important for us that is that we needed to have one directional links. We didn't want uh, to be able to go into this centralized platform cluster and be able to do request the other way around so you can actually change things in production from a centralized place. So we wanted to be only possible to ship data in one direction, which was also pretty easy to do. Um, another thing that we've sort of been focusing a lot on at, at Lunar is platform engineering and really making it easy for our developers to, to adopt and, and be secure, be compliant, follow all the best practices. Um, so our platform mission uh, is really to to empower our developers. That's more or less what's, what's written here. Um, build everything in as much as possible. Uh, we, we do that uh, by, we've created a couple of tools ourselves. Um, doesn't matter that much, but the shuttle up here is, is open source. You can find it, but it's a way for us to sort of 
deal with centralized uh, scripts, uh, templating. Uh, we do a lot of different stuff that sort of make it easy for developers and we can provide um, yeah, compliance basically out of the box for them as a platform team so they don't have to, to do that themselves. And I'll show you some examples in a second. The other tool that uh, we need to, to mention here is Release Manager. And that's a CLI tool called Ham Control. It's not really like the meat. It's the Ham was the first chimpanzee in space. It was re a really bad name. Uh, I always have to explain it when I talk about it, so it's kind of annoying. Um, but anyway, it's called Ham Control. And what it does is it, it's basically able to move um, artifacts from one place in a, in a Git repository to another place in a Git repository. And I'll show you a, a short picture here. We start with Shuttle. Um, what it basically does for us, it's, it's creating this abstraction on every service at Lunar has the shuttle.yaml file that points to a centralized plan, that we call it, which stores all this uh, different uh, configuration uh, that we deliver as a platform team to, to the teams. We build a lot of abstractions around that, how to get a database, how to uh, get us into the service mesh, how to all kinds of different things. Um, and the other thing uh, is on the other side here is, is ham control. Um, it's basically, as I mentioned, a way to move things around in, a, in this config repository so that we can actually move uh, some Kubernetes manifest into uh, to a specific environment and then have flux as we use for reconciliation to actually apply this. All right, so that's sort of something I just needed to, to sort of highlight to, to in order to, f to understand how we then sort of implemented this uh, with a service mesh. Um, and how does that really help us as a bank? Well, right now, uh, we, we get MTLS out of the box, which is definitely a nice thing as a bank to actually get this out of the box, move towards zero trust networking, the beyond prod uh, by Google research. So having that is, is really a, a thing that was really good to, to get. Uh, another issue we were starting to see at this point was the GRPC load balancing internally. If, you're, if you try to do uh, GRPC in Kubernetes, you might know that once you sort of connect to a pod, um, all requests are sort of pinned to that pod, which is quite annoying. Um, so having something in there that are sort of able to, to help you distribute uh, and, and actually do load balancing was a really nice feature to get as well. So it, it looks more like this to actually get a, a more even distribution of requests between the, the services that you have running. Um, another cool feature that we got from the Dengadi setup was what's called service profiles. Um, it's basically a, a nice way for our developers to sort of specify uh, item potency, retriable endpoints and paths uh, so that the proxy layer can, can do this for them uh, and, and they don't have to do this in, the, in their services. And they can do, specify this using the, the specs they're already writing their sort of uh, specifications in uh, with protobufs or open APIs, the XML as here. Um, and just get the mesh to actually do this and ha handle this on the, on the network layer or the proxy layer instead of them doing it. Um, yeah, so it's just if a, f a request fails, retry by the proxy level instead of doing this in the service. That's also a nice feature to get. And then last uh, feature that we are really excited about is uh, in Linkerd Linkerd 212. That's now this path-based uh, routing policies that allows us to, for example, in this uh, example, say that Prometheus is only allowed to scrape the metrics endpoint. So being able to lock down and, and sort of ensure that only services that need to talk to each other actually are able to, to talk to each other. Um, cool. Um, so that's sort of one of the, all, all the stuff that we sort of got out of the box by now adding a service mesh to our stack. Um, another thing that was very important for us in, in this was really, uh, especially around the complexity and, and sort of adding a service mesh to our stack was incremental adoption and be able to, to do that. And that was uh, also a thing that we built into this shuttle tool so that we allowed our different teams to experiment and then just try it out and see how, how it sort of uh, went. So the first thing we did was to create like an alpha feature in our shuttle setup that allows developers to say, hey, I want to deploy this into our development environment and see how it works. Um, and we let that run for a, a while and had people experiment and, and see if they sort of could find any errors. Um, then we moved on to a, like a more global thing that now all environments just are sort of being added into the mesh. Um, and then lastly, uh, we have enabled this by default. So now this is something you as a developer at Lunar get out of the box. You don't have to think about this anymore. It's just part of the abstractions and sort of the things that we provide as a platform team. 
And then multi-cluster functionality. So I'm not sure if you're that familiar with how Linkerd works and, and the multi-cluster aspects of Linkerd, so I just wanted to, to bring this in as well. It was pretty uh, simple to do. You, you basically just have to install the multi-cluster control plane, uh, got that up and running in, in both of your clusters, and then you, you use the command or the CLI to actually just create a link. Uh, and you can do that the other way around as well, which is this example. So you, in, in this case, you will have a bidirectional link uh, between your uh, two clusters. And what you get is some components, you get a gateway and you get a service mirror and have another example that sort of uh, highlights what these components do. So the service mirror basically listens for the API server on the opposing or sort of the opposite cluster, uh, listening for specific annotations. Uh, the default one is that on a service in, of a Kubernetes service in one cluster, you can sp set the annotation mirror.linkerd.io exported true. You can of course control these and, and name them as you want. Uh, and then it's the service mirror just basically mirrors that over to the other cluster and, and creates that service, um, making it super easy and transparent for services on that cluster to basically call the service and, and traffic will just go through. I haven't created the, the gateway here, but there's a gateway in, in the middle here as well to actually sort of route the traffic into to the service A on the other side. So that's sort of how it works very simply uh, or simplicity. Um, then for us, so we, as mentioned, we were starting out with this log management between AWS accounts. Um, but then as, at some point, our company and our founder decided to, to acquire another company. Um, so we acquired a, a company called Lindify, um, and later another company uh, called Paylike. Um, and that sort of put us in, a, in an interesting sort of uh, point, because now we needed to actually connect these different environments. And, the case of Lendify was that they were running in, in Asia um, and we were running everything in AWS. Um, they were also do, doing a lot of things around uh, creating Azure app services. So we needed a way to, to connect Azure app services with stuff running in a Kubernetes cluster in AWS. And at, at the same point, we were also building stuff around in GCP because we were moving our data stack there. So we also needed connectivity between those accounts as well. And we thought, hey, we have multi-cluster running already. It works super nice. We've been running that for a year. It's stable. Let's just use that to connect uh, be as between all these different cloud providers. But then we also came into to this issue. We, we didn't have everything running in a Kubernetes cluster. We had a lot of things running outside a Kubernetes cluster in, in Azure, for example, as app services. So how do we actually contact an app service from a Kubernetes service in AWS through a Kubernetes cluster and then out to, to the actual resource in, in Azure. And the other way around as well, because the Azure app service might need to be able to request something that runs in a Kubernetes cluster in AWS. Um, so how do I to actually handle that uh, use case? Um, we sort of looked at, uh, we couldn't really find a, a good solution in sort of the open source. So we just built something ourselves using Envoy. We called it the Backbone Gateway. Um, it's basically just an abstraction of over some configuration of Envoy. Um, but it really provides us with a sort of a thing we can deploy in each cluster that makes connectivity in and out of a cluster in each cloud possible. And then we build a nice sort of abstraction using this shuttle uh, uh, tool that I was mentioning before so that it is, again, easy for our developers to actually um, you know, say, I want to expose this resource for services running in, in this cluster. So in this case, um, we have egress, so that this is the case where an AWS service needs to contact an Azure app service. Um, you, of course, need to instruct or sort of make this available. So what we do here is that we basically just generate um, some Envoy configuration, and then we create a Kubernetes service in front with an annotation saying this needs to be mirrored into the AWS side. And then it's possible for services in AWS to actually call over through the proxy and out into the to Azure uh, resource. And then the other way around here, Envoy really doesn't do much or it actually doesn't do anything. Um, we, we just use the same sort of repository to create an abstraction around creating an internal ingress instead. Um, and then, um, yeah, we allow traffic to, to flow over to the other cluster. So again, using this tool that we already built and, and creating some nice abstractions for developers to actually make it pretty easy for them to, to get this multi-cloud uh, capabilities in place. So the use case basically, yeah, my service needs to be able to request uh, credit scores from a service running in Azure App Services. How do I do that? 
I just showed you that, so it looks something like this. Um, super easy for them. They just needed to add this into a repository and then sort of the platform took care of, uh, care of it for them. Um, the last thing we built around the, the backbone uh, gateway setup was really, we, we wanted to monitor uh, sort of the connectivity between the different clouds, what was the latency. Um, so we built something we call the Backbone Gateway Probe. So it's basically just a simple Go service that are probing another of these Backbone uh, Gateway Probes in, in another cluster and register and logs uh, what was the latency. And then we just use our tool to visualize this. Um, one of the interesting things that we sort of saw is the, the latency um, from, so we have AWS to GCP was 30 seconds, uh, but from DCP to AWS, it was like 60 seconds on average, which was an interesting finding. Um, but it's, it's nice to have this, and uh, now we, we, we sort of can monitor all the links. So we, ha we built that ourselves to, to, to basically just do that. It was pretty simple. And wrapping up, um, I think service mesh really sort of uh, increases uh, security, reliability, and scalability for us. Um, but we needed to build a lot of stuff, uh, sort of wrap it, a, a lot of things around it because we also want to make this easy. We don't want our developers to, to do a lot of YAML and, and stuff like that. We want to sort of abstract all of that away. Um, but now from the developer perspective, it's, it's, it's pretty simple for them. They don't really have to care about all of this. We, we take care of that for them. Um, with the backbone gateway that I talked about and, and showed you before, uh, we now have like this uh, communication backbone between basically the three different clouds that we are present in right now. And we can expand that to anywhere that where we can put a Kubernetes cluster and, and, and add a, a Linkerd control plane. Um, so that's pretty nice. Um, yeah, and then this uh, shuttle tool basically just allows us to, to take in all of these new technologies as a platform team, experiment, see what works, what doesn't work, try out the different I don't know, service measures and, and see what works and what doesn't, um, and then decide and, and have them ad adopt it. Um, and the last thing that we sort of learned in this, and I haven't talked that much about GitOps, but the way we sort of structured our Git repository was that each environment are represented by a directory in, in like this config repository. And having this tool that I uh, talked about earlier, the, the HAM control tool, basically just allows us to create a new folder for Azure and, dev or DCP dev, and then we can basically just use this tool to release. So we get like a, um, a uniform way to basically release stuff into multiple different cloud providers, which is pretty nice. Of course, there are some services if you're using like a load balancer in DCP or in AWS, so there are some differences, probably some different annotations based on what kind of load balancer you're using. But once that's sort of taken care of, you, you, you really get this feeling of we can deploy this to anywhere using the same um, way of, of, of basically working with, with the stuff. And I think I actually went a bit fast. So um, I think that was it for me. So if, yeah, if we have time for questions. Yeah, thank you so much, Casper. Big round of applause, please. And we do, uh, we do have five minutes before the coffee break. So does anybody have any questions? And I will run over with a microphone. Okay, running over the microphone. Uh, what are your concerns with uh, intra and inter mesh security, uh, like between like east west between pods? Like, where does that fall into your guys' like, um, like uh, design and thoughts around service mesh? So, can can you repeat again? The question was. So, what are your uh, do you guys? take any approaches uh, to uh, deal with like layer seven security in service mesh. Uh, so like doing like internal WAF uh, between pods, that kind of thing. Um, no, not really. Um, so, so right now all of this is, is basically done using, um, you know, uh, wide listing of IP addresses, a very static uh, old school kind of way of doing it, I guess. Um, so, so basically the Linkerd control plane, when you run the link command, uh, it generates the configuration, it generates uh, the secret and the API token so that it can talk to the API server of the other cluster. Um, and then we just internally sort of allow communication across the different, um, yeah, basically the different clusters. So that's, that's how it works today. So you guys don't have any kind of uh, like intrusion detection system or uh, kind of like threat detection stuff going on? 
yeah, we do, we do have a lot of uh, logging and, and a lot of uh, metrics and, and alerts going on and, and that really monitors this. Uh, we have a, a more dedicated security team that sort of monitors this more closely. Okay, thank you. Sure. Anybody else? Is, oh, question over. Who put your hand up first? You, you win because you're closer. I apologize. Thanks. Um, great talk, and I'm like really happy that this has worked out so well for you, it seems, in production. I'm kind of curious about, you mentioned at the very beginning that scale of complexity versus features and so on, and we're sitting on that scale at the moment. And I'm kind of curious about having run with this in production for a few years. You mentioned a lot of things about observability, and that's what a lot of people say around the service meshes. Did you find that the service mesh has provided you an easier way to troubleshoot production or even QA issues because of that observability, or does it cause more issues because it's really complex and hard to understand? Yeah, um, it definitely caused some um, interesting problems. Uh, ports not being allowed or some using some weird protocols of some, some sort in, in some of the services that we are running. So we definitely see some issues, but for us it's been really I, th I think it outweighs sort of, so all the features and, and the things we get outweigh some of this complexity. But it's been, we've been doing a lot of stuff around actually uh, monitoring what is the proxy doing, um, control, uh, configuring the control plane uh, at, at some point when we added this to the entire fleet of services, uh, we need to scale the control plane a little bit. Uh, and, and, and of course had to, to spend some time in actually figuring out what, what is going on now that we see this LinkedIn destination thing is, is just, you know, <laughs> Crash looping. So why is that? Um, so, it, but I think we we are now also more people. Um, so now it's we have enough resources to actually sort of dedicate a, one or two people to actually know more about and get deeper into what the service mesh actually does. Um, but it does add some complexity, definitely. Uh, great talk. Um, I just had a question about your adoption phase. You mentioned that it took a few years to adopt a service mesh. Was there any sort of a notable point of friction that uh, prolonged that adoption? And was it like the complexity of the services meshes at the time, or was it that they were too invasive? Yeah, or I think uh, when we tried out Linkerd one back in seventeen, um, we just you know put a, so you have the option to to just enable Linkerd on uh, the, the Linkerd proxy injector on on a namespace level. Uh, and when we did that, everything just broke. Uh, nothing worked. <laughs> we needed to figure out what what the hell is going on here. Um, uh, so that sort of, um, yeah, that was kind of why we stopped back then. Um, then I actually had like in, I think it was in 19 when my colleague tried out Linkerd 2, he actually did a presentation at a meetup at some point and, and showing how easy it was to uh, do this incremental, uh, incremental adoption of a, of a mesh. But we wasn't really ready at that point still to, we were still like two people that were sort of handling everything around platform. So we didn't really feel that we, we would yeah, have enough people to actually sustain this. Um, but yeah, I think um, try it out, do the incremental incremental adoption and trying out things uh, slowly and and let it run for I don't know a, a while and and validate that this is actually uh, working and, and and that that was a really nice way to to actually get the confidence in, in actually running this. Well, okay, I think we got time. For one last question. Okay. Morning. Um, in regards to your industry being highly regulated and going down the multi-cluster route along with what I assume is sensitive data, did you have any frictions or any restrictions in regards to uh, auditing or in regards to um, with that cross-cluster uh, cross communication and basically data where it's stored or that kind of thing? Um, as it is right now, we haven't really had that uh, any sort of audit uh, things, uh, it, we have a really sort of um, progressive uh, CISO that are very techy and in, I think he's really good at explaining what is going on here um, in, a, in a language that they understand and I think that's been very help, helpful. Um, I'm not involved in, 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 in that as aspect, um, but now we haven't really uh, gotten any, uh, anything yet, at least, <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> cool, thank you. All right, thank you so much, Casper. If, if you, anybody has any questions, I'm guessing you're gonna be hanging around by the coffee pot to kind of definitely just lift yourself up after that fantastic talk. Sure. So big round of applause again, please.